So we're going to continue what we started yesterday, combinational logic. We're going to finish it up and talk about sequential logic. By the end of this lecture, you, you should be able to design uh, things like uh, traffic light controllers, for example. Of course, you don't know exactly how to do it and build it, but conceptually, you should be able to do that. Uh, but before I continue, uh, well, I guess we've actually covered almost all of this. I'm going to cover a little bit more on combinational circuits and a little bit on logic simplification and minimizing logic circuits, and then we're going to continue. Basically, that's, this is the agenda for today. Next week, it's going to be hopefully even more interesting. You will figure out how to implement what we've discussed in a programming language, which is called the hardware description language. And in our case, we're going to cover Verilog. Uh, so it's going to be fun. And we're going to tackle a topic that we were kind of ignoring almost, although I'm going to talk about that topic a little bit today, timing and verification. How do you actually ensure that the circuit meets your timing requirements? How long does the circuit take? And how do you actually verify the circuit, both in terms of a functional perspective and a timing perspective? So these are extremely important topics, actually, even though they may be some of the toughest topics that we're going to cover in the logic design part of this course. OK, so I'll remind you of your assignments. There's a deadline associated with it. I'm going to give you another extra assignment. Hopefully, it's fun. It's basically reading Moore's paper from 1965. Not many people in the world do this. I think it's good for people who are starting out uh, doing computer design or computer science to do this, because this paper is really extremely influential. I mean, if, uh, Frank talked about this, but Gordon Moore was the, we know Moore's law clearly and how important it is. But Gordon Moore went on to be a co-founder of Intel, and Intel had a lot of inf influence in our lives, and it's continue continuing to have a lot of influence, clearly. But this paper has a very nice empirical observation, as you know, that later became to be known as Moore's Law. And I think it's good for you to get acquainted with it. And I think it's actually a very nice deal from your perspective, because if you do it, you get 1% extra credit for the course, which means that if you don't do well 1% on the exam, you can make up for it. <laughs> That's good. And it's only three pages. It's actually two and a half pages, right? There's not much to it. And I strongly recommend that you follow my guidelines for paper review. Uh, they're actually on these slides. And video, there's a video associated with it. They're a short video discussing how to do paper reviews. Uh, hopefully, this will be useful for your life in the future also. Because whenever you read a document that's presented to you, either it's a presentation or a paper or a talk, it's good to have a methodical approach to reviewing what was presented to you. And I think I have uh, developed a methodical approach based on many, many years of writing papers, reading papers, evaluating talks, uh, and also digesting other people's materials who have talked about how to review things. And hopefully, that'll be useful for you over here. OK, does that sound like a good deal? Everybody's happy? If you don't do it, that's fine. You, you get 0%. <laughs> but you don't lose anything. <laughs> Yeah, it compounds, basically. There are two, if, you, if you do both of the assignments, you'll get 2% additional credit. That's what compound means, right? <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, so required readings, remember, I already discussed the nature of the reading, so everything still applies. But this is we're, we're covering combinational logic. We're going to cover sequential logic today. Hopefully, it'll be done with it, but I'm not sure exactly. Uh, and we're going to finish hardware description language and timing and verification by the end of next week. So hopefully, by the end of next week, will be done with these chapters. And as I said, your readings are front-loaded, meaning the front part of the course will have a lot more readings. And again, you can get away with doing no reading at all also, as long as you understand the material uh, that we discuss and we present. OK, so I'm going to start with wrapping up combinational logic circuits and design. Remember that we were discussing tri-state buffers. We, we discussed a bunch of structures, decoders, multiplexers, uh, programmable logic arrays, uh, and uh, now we're going to discuss tri-state tri buffers. Uh, well, we did discuss tri-state buffers, so I'm not going to talk about that in detail. But we're going to use all of those structures actually later today in this course when we build a memory. You will need a decoder, and you will need a multiplexer when building a memory. And tri-state buffers are useful for the reasons that we discussed yesterday. Basically, tri-state buffers enable, enables gating of different signals to a single wire. And you remember why it was useful. This was a pictorial example. You have a shared bus. Uh, interconnect between CPU and memory, and only one value can be on that wire. And you uh, basically use tri-state buffers to connect whatever can load or can gate something onto that wire. 
Uh, and if the CPU is going to transmit a signal, then you enable this tri-state buffer such that uh, the value that's coming out of the CPU is passed on to this wire, and you ensure that you don't enable this tri-state buffer such that the memory doesn't put its value onto the bus. Uh, so basically, you ensure by controlling the tri-state buffers that only one value is on the bus at a given time. So control is extremely important, clearly. Tri-state buffer is what enables uh, the possibility of multiple agents, let's say multiple different logic blocks, I call them also agents, uh, to uh, drive a single bus, but you need to have a control logic to also enable that to be done correctly, right? If your control logic has a bug and it basically enables both of these tri-state buffers at the same time, that's a problem. Because what happens in that case is both CPU's output and memory's output gets gated onto this bus, and you basically have multiple different voltages driving this, and you basically have a, a circuit that uh, is overloaded. So you don't know what the result will be in that case, right? Okay, so basically control logic we will see when we build a microprocessor. That's really important, keep that in mind for now. This is another example from your book, actually. If you read the book, you will see that it's a very similar example, but real systems are much more complicated today. Today you may have a shared bus across these. Actually, memory bus is a good example of this. Uh, okay. So you can also do other things using tri-state buffers. Uh, remember, we implemented a multiplexer using uh, AND gates and OR gates, right? But you can do that with tri-state buffers also. So once you have a tri-state buffer, this is a very nice design for a multiplexer from your book again that shows how you would use two tri-state buffers to select between two different signals. Remember, multiplexer is a, is a selector. Actually, selector is probably a better name uh, because it describes the functionality much better. But basically, your job is to select between two inputs, two data inputs, and a tri-state buffer is essentially a selector. If you go back to this picture, you're selecting between two inputs, right? Essentially, that's a mux in the end. If you have two of these tri-state buffers, uh, and if, if the select line is zero, data zero is passed to I. If the select line is one, this becomes enabled and data one gets passed to I, and this becomes disabled clearly in that case. That's beautiful. So of course you can expand this and you can actually have four tri-state buffers. Now this is a four to one mux. This is a two to one mux. This is a four to one mux. There are four data inputs and two select inputs as it should be in a mux, right? And you can see that these are the uh, implicants that lead to the enabling of different uh, muxes over here. Uh, not, not muxes, different tri-state buffers over here. Of course, we don't show the AND gates over here, right? These are AND gates that drive the inputs of the uh, enable signals. Make sense? You can build a 8 to 1 also over here. There are clearly trade-offs associated with it, which we're not going to talk about. But tri-state buffers are actually very useful. Okay, let me, uh, we're going to wrap up the combination logic uh, elements soon, but I would like to give, uh, open your mind a little bit because these combination logic elements are really interesting, they could be interesting for other purposes. For example, you can use a multiplexer as a lookup table uh, to perform logic functions. Let me give you an example over here. This again from your book. This is a multiplexer. This is AND gate, right? We know this very well. You can implement this truth table using an AND gate. No question about that. But you could implement this truth table using a four to one multiplexer as well. How? I'm not going to show you the internal implementation, but if you look at the module, 4 to 1 multiplexer has four data inputs, uh, uh, well, well, four inputs uh, and two select signals, right? Now, my two select signals are going to select one of the inputs for sure. And if I hardwire the first three, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 to 0, that's 0, and if I hardwire the last data input to 1, what I'm doing is basically hardwiring this part as input, and A and B, depending on the value of A and B, I'm selecting one of those. Make sense, right? If A and B is one, one, then I'm going to pass the hardwired one input to Y, which is what this truth table is. And if A and B are anything other than one, one, I'm gonna pass the hardwired zero value to Y. That sounds beautiful, right? Of course, it's more expensive than an AND gate, but this is just a proof of concept showing that you can use a multiplexer, you can hardwire these inputs as a lookup table. Now you can basically, you're basically looking up the values, the output of the function based on the values of the inputs. You're not using hardwired logic as a gate, but you're looking up. This is what, this is what a lookup means, because you've already hardwired uh, the, the output values as a function of the input values. 
Okay, so that's one example. Of course, now you can say this is expensive, but you can go and simplify it. And this is, your book does this essentially. Basically, this is exactly the same function over here. You can go doing logic simplification using either Boolean algebra or different methods by realizing, for example, you can realize that uh, for, for these output values, uh, the value doesn't depend on B, so it's really zero in the end. If A is zero, Y is zero. If A is one, the value is really the value of B. So you realize that also now you actually have a simple mux as opposed to a four to one mux, you have a two to one mux as a lookup table. And if now your inputs are different, your A is the select input, B is one of the data inputs that goes to the one uh, select line, and you hardwire the other one to zero. So if A is zero, you get zero at the end. If A is one, you get B at the end. Sounds cool, right? <laughs> okay, you can implement even, uh, so this is an XOR function that's implemented using a multiplexer. XOR is A, a prime B uh, plus A uh, B prime, right? You can do that exactly, again, uh, this way. Basically, you, you can simplify the XOR. If A is zero, the output should be, uh, you should select B. If A is one, you should select B bar. Make sense? And the function Y is essentially XOR in this case, using a multiplexer. So it's beautiful. It's, in the end, it's Boolean logic. You can actually show that all of this is Boolean logic, but it's a circuit implementation of a Boolean logic. There may be many circuit implementation of it's the same Boolean function, essentially. That's what we're showing over here. So this is another more complicated example, which I'm not going to go through, but it's relatively easy to understand again, right? A multiplexer uh, enumerates all of the uh, min terms in this case, I guess. Uh, uh, I mean, another way of looking at it is actually basically uh, if you want to use a multiplexer as a lookup table, you wire uh, the min terms uh, to one and all of the max terms to zero, and you use your inputs as your select inputs. That's the easiest way. Of course, that's expensive, right? It's expensive circuitry, and that's what people have done over here. And this is the function you get in the end. Make sense? But this is a beautiful lookup table. You may find such lookup tables on your FPGAs, for example. Of course, much... Uh, they're, they're much denser. Okay, so similarly, decoder is no uh, stranger to be used as a lookup table, so you can use your decoder as a lookup table also. It's gonna be, look similar to your programmable logic array because programmable logic array actually uses a decoder on the end part. Uh, basically, you can combine a decoder with OR gates to build logic functions. Right? So this is, uh, this is A x nor B. And if you want A x nor B, Basically, you have a two to four decoder, A, B are inputs, and you get all the min terms at the end, as we've discussed, and you pick the min terms which, are, uh, which lead to A, X, nor B, which is A, B, and A bar, B bar, essentially. And you order. Makes sense, right? So you can convince yourself that this is the case. But this is hopefully more familiar. Multiplexer may be a little bit less familiar because this looks like a PLA in the end, right? It's a programmable logic array. Okay. Sounds cool? Okay, so now I'm going to cover logic simplification a little bit, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Uh, given that you know how to do Boolean algebra, you can clearly simplify logic. Uh, well, what happened there? But let's take a look at quickly uh, this logic. This is the uh, sum of products implementation uh, of a full adder, right, as we discussed. This is, uh, I, I call this sum of products form logic because essentially you have uh, the sum of products uh, form implemented using AND gates and OR gates in hardware over here. And this was our truth table for the adder, full adder as you remember. So our goal is now of course simplify this full adder because it's probably expensive. So what is the simplification? I'm not gonna go through the steps, but it's actually relatively simple. You can do it even, even, even logically by looking at the values and if, if the truth table is simple like this. So the sum value is really an XOR of A, B, C. Why? Because if you look over here, sum is uh, one only if an odd number of A, B, C is one, right? Only when you have one uh, of these input values one or three of the input values one. Makes sense, so that's an XOR function. But you could go there, of course, by uh, starting from the sum of products form and actually simplifying using logic equations. C out is actually an interesting, another interesting circuit. Uh, this is the carry out. Uh, that's really the majority function. It's basically, if at least two of the inputs are one, you get a one at the end. If at least two of the inputs are zero, you get a zero in the end. 
Make sense? So that's your majority function, and the majority is simplified this way. Again, you could, you could do it by just looking at this table over here, right? So this is C out. It's one if A, B are one, uh, if uh, C, B are one, if C, A are one, or, or if all of them are one, right? OK. Or you could, you could start with the sum of products form and do the Boolean equation and simplify it, which I'm not going to do right now because we already did similar things uh, yesterday. There are other ways of simplifying Boolean logic. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, tell you what, are the, um, like what, is the, what is the real fundamental thing that enables you to get rid of variables. So if you look at the original Boolean expression, the logic circuit may, be, may not be optimal. Someone may come up with something like this, right? Clearly, you can simplify it because there's no point on in doing AA, right? A and A. So the question is, can we reduce a Boolean expression to an equivalent expression with fewer terms? If you actually do, all, do your homework, you will find out that this really simplifies to A plus B. But you also know that this is not a sum of products form, right? This is just a random circuit thrown at you, or random Boolean equation thrown, thrown at you. Sum of products form is nice because it's standard. It's standard for every circuit. Every circuit has a single sum of products form. OK, but you can simplify anything. You can start with sum of products, or you can start with something thrown at you. And using Boolean algebra laws, you can uh, simplify things, right? So the goal of logic simplification is manifold, actually. You would like to reduce the number of gates and inputs, potentially, and these may be different things. You would like to reduce the implementation cost. And there are other things also that may play into this. Like if you know the power consumed by each gate type, you may want to actually simplify to a form such that you minimize power consumption. We're not going to talk about that here, but that's a real thing today because power is so important. Latency is another thing that we will see in timing. Uh, you may want to actually simplify to a form that minimizes latency because not all logic gates may be exactly the same in terms of how long they take to evaluate a function, right? As we discussed, there may be implementations of NOR gates that are much faster than implementations of NAND gates. So it's really important to know that whenever you simplify, there may be other goals. But if your only goal is to minimize the number of gates and inputs and implementation costs, then you really would like to have a minimal function. OK. So basically, everything we've discussed yesterday and today is the base of what automated design tools are doing today. They start with some canonical form, or they start with some equation that's thrown at them, and they basically apply rules. Uh, they may, for example, convert this equation back into a truth table, which they then express in canonical form, and then they can simplify that. Or they can apply, and go, uh, they can apply the rules uh, of Boolean algebra as much as possible to this equation so that they can arrive at this equation. So we're not going to talk further about these tools, but they're actually tools that have enabled large scale, uh, very large scale integration of circuits today. Because if a human needed to do everything by hand, for, I don't know, 20 billion transistors or gates that consist of 20 billion transistors, that would be a disaster. Right? A lot of it is automated today. There are parts of the design in high performance processors where humans go and do the simplification and layout because they're so timing critical that tools are not good enough to do that. So those are the cases where actually, as a designer, you should really know what you're doing. But in many other cases, you can actually specify a circuit. You can specify a state diagram, as we will talk about later today. And a tool takes over and basically generates a circuit for you. Sounds good, right? So keep that in mind. So if you, uh, OK, uh, let me actually, what, what do these tools do? Uh, they are systematic techniques for simplifications that are amenable to automation. So a key tool is this uniting theorem. Uniting theorem, what is that? It sounds fancy, but it's basically nothing other than the fact that you can eliminate uh, B over here. Because A, B bar plus A, B is equal to B, right? Basically, B's value changes within the rows where function is equal to 1. Function equal to 1 also means onset. I'm introducing some terminology, but this simple terminology. Whereas A's value does not change within those rows, which means that the function's output is not dependent on B. It's clearly dependent on A, right? So basically, if an input can change without changing the output, that input value is not needed. That's the idea over here. So you can eliminate it. So A remains in that case. You could do this visually, like we've discussed over here. So I didn't invoke any Boolean algebra law. I just said, when I look at this truth table visually, I see that B changes, but the function doesn't change. 
That means that B is irrelevant. B actually changes and covers all of the values it can possibly cover, zero and one. We cannot take any other value. So the function's output one is independent of B, which means that I can eliminate B visually. But I can also do this, which is the Boolean algebra version of it, right? Okay, so you can do the same thing over here. Basically, this is another function. B's value does in this case stays the same within the onset rows. A's value changes, which means that the function output is independent of A, A is eliminated, and B remains. And basically, you get B bar over here, because the function output, once you eliminate A, you realize that function output is a complement of B, right? Visually again. Okay, so the essence of simplification is really finding two element subsets of the onset, where the function is one, where only one variable changes its value. This single va varying variable can be eliminated in that case, right? So if you actually have a nice way of doing this, methodical way of doing this, you can actually eliminate a lot of variables over time. So people have developed multiple ways of doing this. Carnot maps is one way. Now, unfortunately, I'm gonna tease you with it, but I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna give you that as an extra assignment, as you wish to do. It's not required, you won't get credit for it, but you'll have fun with it. So basically, this is a pictorial way of minimizing circuits by visualizing opportunities for this simplification. So basically, you visualize a truth table, and you basically find out where the different variables can be eliminated, okay? So that's for you to study on your own. I'm not gonna hold you responsible for it, but I'd recommend looking at, looking at it if you're interested. It's a fun thing. Uh, and I have it in the backup slides. Uh, Harris and Harris covers it in section 2.7. And if you're really interested in looking at lectures, these are the places where you can look at in past lectures. But this year, we're not gonna cover it since uh, there are actually other ways of doing simplification. This is just a fun way of doing simplification. But you can have fun on your own, I think. Okay, any questions? So we're now done with combinational circuits. No questions? Okay, so I'm gonna start with sequential circuits. Let me see. And we're gonna learn a lot today, actually, but let me actually pull, put that up while I'm getting some water. So let's see how much we can cover. So basically, we're gonna look at some elements that can store information. So far, we're not storing information. We have inputs, we have outputs. Outputs are always a function of inputs and they change. There's no information that's stored. We talked about the adder yesterday, right? You can build a much more, much more compact adder if you actually were able to store the bit that you generated previously. Right, as opposed to chaining many of these full adders together. So we're gonna see a way of doing that. But, but to be able to do that, you need to have circuits that can store information. And once you have that, you can build finite state machines that we're gonna talk about. And next week, we're gonna cover very log implementations of both sequential and combinational circuits. So let's start. So basically, as we discussed last time, combinational circuit output depends only on the current input, right? We want circuits that can remember the past a little bit. Basically, that can produce output depending on the current as well as past input values, circuits with memory, essentially. That way you can remember what was the previous sum and you can also generate the next sum for the next bit. Right? And you can keep remembering the previous sums that you've generated for the last 30, 31 bits and you produce the sum for the 32nd bit and eventually you have a 32-bit number that you generated by using only single bit addition circuits. Right. So you can remember, you can think of this as our little adder, simple adder, and the storage element stores the previous sums. Okay, so how can we design a circuit that stores information? That's the key question. So this is called a sequential circuit. Sequential circuit is not just the storage element. It's the combinational circuit plus the storage element. In fact, there are usually no sequential circuits that have just storage elements because you need to do something to the storage element, right? You have to have something combinational to access the storage element. Okay, so basically to be able to store information, you need to capture data. And humans store information in many ways, right? I capture data, for example, by writing to a piece of paper. That's one way of capturing data. People used to etch stuff on rocks. That's another way of capturing data. So we need a way of capturing data digitally in this case, right? Uh, actually, people store data on glass, for example, right? That's actually a very interesting project that's going on right now in some places. How do you actually store data on glass? 
why there could be advantages for doing this. That could be very, very long term. That could be good archival storage. It could be much, much uh, more durable compared to some other electronic medium that could potentially lose charge, right? Okay, so the basic, but we are gonna look at storing data within the context of the circuit elements that we've built so far, because that's how we can actually uh, make a computer work because we can manufacture these circuit elements. We know how to manufacture them in a single chip. So the basic element is really a cross-coupled inverter. So if I give you this circuit over here, two inverters, cross-coupled, meaning the output of one goes to the input of the other. Now I've captured data, which is the, the value that's at the output of these inverters, right? Now you can look at this and convince yourself that that's the case. Now I'm ignoring some timing issues, right? But in the end, this should stabilize to, this is Q and this is Q bar, okay. So this has two stable states. There could be some uh, problem with stability as we will see when we talk about timing and verification next week, but ignore that. At the stable time, Q is either one or zero. Okay, makes sense, right? And that's a good invariant to maintain because you cannot have Q and Q bar equal to one at the same time. That violates Boolean logic, right? You don't want that. If you have that, then there's a problem with your circuit, meaning that maybe there's, a short, uh, there, there's some misconnection in this wire, for example, right? That doesn't get connected to the merger. Okay, but we're going to ignore that. So these are the two stable states over here. You can again convince yourself that those are those make sense. So this is the issue with metastability. Basically, this has a third potential state that's called a metastable state with both outputs oscillating between zero and one. So we will see this later when we talk about timing and verification. Because in the stable state, this should be zero, this should be one, or the other way around. But there is some time it takes, because the circuit is not stable, this may become zero and this may become one, and they may actually oscillate. And eventually, the circuit resolves to some value. But we will see that when we talk about timing and verification. We're not gonna go deep into it, but these circuits that are connected with feedback loops like this usually have that sort of problem, metastability problems. If you're actually relying on the output of something as your input, which produces your output, and the other thing is relying on that output as its input, which produces its output, you have a feedback loop. And that feedback loop actually is always prone to metastability issues depending on when the signals change, the circuit may take some time so that it can settle to a value. Okay, that's basically the essence of metastability. I'm not gonna tell you even more than that, except I'm gonna show you a fancy picture next week. Okay, so you don't want to be in this state clearly, but eventually you'll settle. But this is also not useful without a control mechanism for setting Q. So if you look at this, okay, it looks nice, but how do I put Q equals one in there? I cannot, right? So in a sense, this is useless. So basically, but this is good because it's going to be our basic element for capturing data or something like this. Okay, so basically a more realistic storage element should have a control mechanism for setting Q. I should be able to say you are going to store zero or you're going to store one. So we will see RS latch soon and that's going to be our basic element. But let's look at SRAM. So this is static random access memory. We're going to cover this later on toward the end of the course especially. But this is what an SRAM cell looks like. It's essentially a cross-coupled inverter. So what we've seen previously is not useless. The previous slide actually is extremely useful because you're using this SRAM, static random access memory, in all your devices. It's essentially fundamentally a cross-coupled inverter. And this is its control mechanism for setting and reading Q. Basically, this is the word line that enables these transistors that enable the value to be read or written to. I'm not gonna tell you more about how this operates because it's more complicated than what we're going to see today. But you can basically have a way of reading Q bar over here, let's say that's called bit line bar or bit line, doesn't matter. But basically you can read the value and sense it and figure out that it's a one or zero. Or you can actually write a value over here uh, using this bit line mechanism. So you can basically drive the bit line value into uh, into the Q or Q bar over there. Okay, we will get back to SRAM as well as DRAM later. You've seen DRAM also. DRAM was just one, one transistor and one capacitor, right? It, it is similar in terms of structures as a word line and bit lines. SRAM is similar, but it's elements, basic storage element that captures data is different. My whole purpose of showing you SRAM over here was to 
uh, ensure that you don't think this is useless. This is actually extremely useful. Okay. Okay. So similarly, uh, let me give you the big picture before we actually focus on to the latches and build. Basically, they're storage elements. And you've seen DRAM clearly. You've seen SRAM just now. You've seen cross-coupled inverters. And we're going to build latches and flip-flops out of them. So let's look at the... Let's look at why we're building these different storage elements, right? Because there, there are trade-offs associated with them. So these latches and flip-flops, they're actually very fast. They're parallel access. They're built in CMOS technology. They can be fabricated with no problem inside a chip, inside a processor chip. But it turns out they're very expensive because one bit actually costs tens of transistors. So with cross-coupled inverters, clearly it's two transistors only, right? But that doesn't work because we cannot control it. So if you want to control it, we're going to add more stuff to it, and that's going to cost tens of transistors soon. Static RAM is relatively fast. Only one data word at a time. Ignore that for now. But it's, it turns out it's expensive compared to... Uh, well, it's less expensive compared to lights and flip-flops, but it's still expensive. So one bit costs about six plus transistors, which I'm not showing over here. Sorry, cross-coupled inverter that costs four transistors. I said two transistors, right? So a cross-coupled inverter cost four transistors because an inverter costs two transistors, if you remember. I have to correct myself. It's interesting. My online error correction mechanism kicked in a little bit later. You guys should have corrected me. I realized I don't, there, there must be something wrong here. An inverter cannot cost a single transistor, but it was operating late. Circuits do online error correction also, actually, but uh, we're not going to get into that. Okay, so basically, uh, a cross-couple inverter costs four transistors. Static RAM is actually not bad. It adds two more transistors, which I showed you over here. Six transistors over here. But there are variants of static RAM that are more robust. I could have eight transistors, for example. But as we go down, we become slower. So DRAM is slower. Reading destroys the content. There are other issues like refresh. Needs special process for manufacturing. But the big advantage is cheap. Basically, one bit costs only one transistor, one capacitor. And this could be much cheaper than six and definitely much cheaper than what we're going to see soon. So there's an advantage. That's why big memories are built with dynamic random access memory. You have eight gig I have eight gigabyte memory in this one. That's dynamic random access memory. But even that's not cheap enough for much bigger memories. So other storage technology like flash memory, hard disk tape, they're much slower. They access, the access takes much longer. And they also happen to be non-volatile. We've also seen phase change memory earlier. But this turns, it turns out this is very cheap. So different technologies have different trade-offs, and this is why we have a memory hierarchy, as we will see later on also. Because you cannot build everything with latches and flip-flops. They're just too expensive. You don't want to have one terabyte of latches and flip-flops. That's a lot of storage. It, it actually doesn't fit. It would not fit in your wafer scale chip. It's so much more expensive compared to a tape, for example. How many people use tapes? Believe it or not, they're actually used. These tapes are used in data centers for archival storage, for example. And they're actually much, much more reliable and long-term compared to flash memory, for example. So even within other storage technologies that I showed you over here, there's, there are differences. Flash memory is much faster than others, but it's also more expensive. Tape is much slower than others, but it's extremely cheap. It's magnetic medium, and you can store lots of data together at the same time. OK, so this is just to give you the big picture. We're going to start with this part. You've already seen this part, but we're going to go back to this. And we won't have time to cover this other storage technology in this course. If you really want to know, you should take a computer architecture course, my next computer architecture course, for example, or the seminar course where we talk about different storage technologies when we read papers. OK. So let's start with our basic storage element, which is the RS latch or SR latch. There's actually, uh, your book uh, differs in its treatment. Uh, well, your book, meaning Harris and Harris, actually is a little bit different in the way it treats the SR latch. I treat it similarly to Pat and Patel. But in the end, um, the, the, the latches are very similar. OK, let me, uh, let me start with it. Basically, what is this latch? Basically, this is the latch that enables you to control Q and Q prime. This is called a latch. That's just term terminology. Basically, you can store data in a latch. So what does a circuit do? Basically, it has a set input and a reset input. 
and it consists of now cross-coupled NAND gates. And again, it's a very similar structure, cross-coupled, right? Feedback loop. So data is stored at Q, inverse at Q bar again. SNR are control inputs, set and reset. In the ideal state, both SNR are held at one. If they're both held at one, you can see that Q becomes Q bar and Q bar becomes Q. No problem, right? Now, if you want to set the circuit, meaning set Q to one, you basically drive this to zero and drive this to one. That way, Q becomes one and this becomes zero, right? Makes sense. If you want to reset the circuit, you drive reset to zero, which means that this becomes one, and you, you drive S to one, which means that this becomes zero. Makes sense, right? So this is uh, our SR latch. And it looks nice. It is nice. It has one problem. Uh, actually, your book has uh, SR latch, uh, or RS latch, I keep flip-flopping between them, but to fine, because people actually use different terminology. Some, some people say SR, some people say RS. There's no conventional terminology, it doesn't matter. Your book shows you an implementation of this, a different SR latch, slightly different SR latch, using cross-coupled NOR gates. So you can do the same thing with a cross-coupled NOR, actually. Of course, you need to choose your S and R inputs accordingly, based on the operation of NOR. I'm not gonna cover the NOR gate. I like the NAND gate better for whatever reason. Uh, but basically, both of the implementations, NOR gate or NAND gate, have a problem. Basically, if S and R should never be both uh, should never both be zero at the same time. Okay, I'm going to explain that briefly again next time. But basically, this is what it is. This is what, this is our uh, this is our truth table. So basically, I say S and R at zero forbidden. Why do I say that? Well. First of all, from a principled point of view, it makes no sense, right? If S and R are both zero, then it doesn't mean that, it doesn't make sense that their Q and Q prime are equal, right? They're both one in that case. That should not happen, clearly. But there is also a circuit level reason, which is, uh, yeah, basically Q and Q prime will both settle to one, and that breaks our invariant, as I said. That's not good, but it turns out now you're dependent on the transitions. If S and R transition back to one at the same time, Q and Q prime begin to oscillate because of the metastability issue that I discussed earlier. And their final values depend on each other. And eventually they will settle to a value that's undeterminable. That's dependent on the characteristics of the implementation of the circuit. So it's not good to have a circuit that looks like this because someone may apply this sort of input to that circuit. Basically, this metastability eventually settles depending on the variation in the circuits. Variation means like which one is bigger, which one is smaller, and manufacturing is not perfect, as you know. Because of imperfect manufacturing, you cannot control this. And remember, our whole goal was to control this. If you cannot control this, that's not good. Then we forbid the input. But whenever you forbid something, someone may forget that it was forbidden. It's actually a very basic human principle also. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs> It applies to circuits also whenever you build. So basically, you don't want to do that in the end. It's not good design. It's not good principle design. It breaks your invariant to begin with. Whenever something breaks your invariant, you should know that there's a problem, and there's a real circuit level problem with the circuit. Okay, so we want to prevent that. That's why we're going to build something different. It's called the gated D latch. So the idea is to, we want to guarantee correct operation of this SR latch. We said that it's a good substrate, but it has this problem when S and R are both one or zero, sorry. Uh, so how do we ensure that S and R are never zero at the same time? Well, we add more gates. We call these the write enable signal. Now this is the data input that we want to write. And if write enable is zero, the data value doesn't change at all. Clearly, right? Because if write enable is zero, uh, S is one, Wait a second. S is one, R is one. If you go back to the circuit, S is one, R is one, you capture, you, you don't change the data value, right? Okay. So if write enable is one, what this circuit enables you to do is to ensure that S and R can never be zero at the same time. Basically, if write enable is one, D value gets passed on, uh, D, D bar gets passed on over here, and D gets passed on over here because there's double inversion as you can see over here, right? 
Yes? Okay, if right neighbor is one, basically that's what happens. So basically Q takes the value of D when right neighbor is set to one. Make sense? And S and R can never be zero at the same time. Okay, so that's our gated D latch. So if right neighbor is zero and um, right neighbor is zero, basically Q doesn't change. It's the same as the previous value of Q. If right neighbor is one, then Q takes the value of D, which is over here. Make sense? Now you need to go and convince yourself that's the case because there are multiple inversions over here, right? If right neighbor is one, this becomes D bar and this becomes D bar bar, which is really D again. Make sense? Okay, good. So now we have a nice way of setting the value in Q without going into metastability issues, without having forbidden states over here. And right neighbor is nice also because it's an intuitive thing. If you want to write to this data element that captures data, we set right neighbor to one. If you don't want to write to it, we want it to keep the data that's over here, we set right neighbor to zero. And if we have only a single data input, which could be zero or one, that's D. So that's our single bit gated D latch. And it works nicely under all conditions. But you can see that it's more expensive, right? This is a NAND gate, this is another NAND gate, another NAND gate, another NAND gate, another inverter. That's what I mean by tens of gates, uh, tens of transistors. But this is what you're going to build in your microprocessor because this is fast. You can make this really fast. Okay. So now that we have a single bit, we can have multiple bits. And this is called a register. So a register is really a collection of data elements that can store single bits. So basically, how can we use D-latches to store more data? This is our D-latch again. I just changed its orientation, as you can see, right? It was like this. Now it's, it turned, it rotated 90 degrees to the right. <laughs> okay. Well, what do you do? Basically, you replicate the D-latches. You use more D-latches. So if you want to store four bits, no problem. I have four data inputs, which lead to four data outputs, queues. I have a right enable. So I want to treat these four bits as a collection of data, meaning I always write to those four bits at the same time. I, I never write to those four bits. Then I set the right enable signal to the same right enable signal to all of them. Right? That's the idea. Basically, a single right enable signal for all latches for simultaneous writing into uh, these four bits at the same time. So I can write the bits in parallel and read the bits in parallel. No additional overhead, except this right enable signal is now broadcast. Broadcast is a special term. Basically, you send, you wire the signal to all of the places over here. That's called a broadcast. Basically, it's broadcast to all of the bits over here, all of the gated D latches. Makes sense, right? And you're going to build these also in your system. Uh, basically, it's a register. It's a structure that stores more than one bit and can be read from and written to. And this register holds four bits, and its data is referenced as Q3 colon zero. So that's a particular way of referring to this register. And it's uh, this data output. The data input is D3 colon zero, of course. So okay, and you can actually show it this way. This is a module level description of it. Inside it could be anything, but now we have gated D latches, but uh, module level, you have a D input, four bits, and Q output, four bits, and a right enable signal. Sounds good, right? So that's the beauty of uh, module is now we are building hierarchy. We don't need to know what's going on underneath the register unless we really want to, right? You can build a register, you can put it as your unit in your language, and you can actually use that later on without knowing what's going on underneath. Okay, so let's talk about memory also, and then, and then we're going to take a break. So memory is very important. Memory is essentially uh, registers, but uh, you need to have ways of accessing them in a different way. So basically, memory is comprised of locations that can be written to or read from, clearly. An example memory array with four locations is here. So basically, you have, two, you have four locations, which means that you have two addresses. Uh, each location in memory is indexed with a unique address. So four locations require two address bits. Let's finish memory and then we're going to take a break. So it's literally the log two number of locations, right? If you have four locations, log two to the four is two. So you need two bits of address. Now let's assume that each location stores eight bits in this case. So how many bits each location stores is called, is termed addressability. The addressability of memory is I have an address 
how many bits are stored in that address? In this case, it's eight. It could be two. In many cases, it's 32. It could be 64. In DRAM, a row address uh, has an addressability of, let's say, eight kilobytes. So it could actually, in, in some, depending on where you look at in the system, the address may actually specify much larger addressability. Fine, but in this case, it's eight bits. So it's basically your definition, how you build your memory. So the entire set of unique location and memory is referred to as the address space. So in this case, our address space is four. You can see that there are only four locations, right? But clearly, typical memory is much larger. It's billions of locations. Your register file could be 32 entries. So what we're going to see is going to be more similar to things that are closer to the registers. But we're going to start with a toy example with four, of course. So we need to be able to address this memory. So let's implement the simple memory array with three bit addressability, which means that every location stores three bits, and address space size of two, meaning I have only two locations. I'm going to start with the simplest memory that you can build compared to a register, because a register has only one location, right? I want actually two locations. I want to be able to say address zero, I read from this part, address one, I read from this part, and this part means I'm going to get three bits from wherever I read from. Okay, so we're going to start with this gated delights. This is our one bit. Clearly, we know how to store a bit. And this is our six-bit memory array. Each of them will be a gated delatch over here. But I need some structures to give it an address and read this part if I give address zero. So the data that I get should be bit two, bit one, bit zero, and address zero if I give it address zero. If I give it address one, I should be able to get bit two, bit one, bit zero in address one. This part. I need that structure. That's an outside structure that enables me to access the right address. So what is that structure? How can we select the address to read? So because there are two addresses, the address size is one bit, clearly, right? I mean, it's obvious over here also, address size is only one bit, address zero, address one. So these are our gated delatches, single bit. You don't need to know what's going on inside. Basically, I build the circuit, and you know the elements of the circuit, actually. This is actually a decoder. I need to decode the address, and I also need to multiplex the output. So basically, the idea is, whenever I get an address, I need to decode the address such that I can enable the reading of the correct address, and I should be able to read from multiple things, which means that, depending on the address, I should be able to select the output coming from the right bits. Which means that I need a selector over here to select between address zero and address one. And I also need a decoder over here to basically enable which one I select. Okay, now let's go into this a little bit more. So this is our word line. It's another terminology. This is our address decoder. If address zero is zero, this becomes a one. This word line is one. If address zero is one, this becomes a zero. Uh, sorry, if address zero is zero, this becomes a one, this becomes a zero, which means that this gets enabled and the output of this propagates over here. Because if this is one, you take the output of this bit over here and that propagates and this is an OR gate. If address zero is zero, this becomes a one, uh, this becomes a zero, meaning that address one is not enabled, so this is zero, so the output of this doesn't matter. So that's how I enable reading from address zero, the three bits in address zero. And the same thing happens here, same thing happens here. So I get the three bits that I want. So this is a multiplexer. If you go back and check, this is really multiplexing two input values depending on a select input. So I decoded the address, that's my select input. This is select bar. And based on the value of the select input, I'm selecting the right bit to read. Okay, makes sense, right? So there's no magic here again. We use an address decoder to decide which one should be enabled, and we use that to drive the selector of the MUX. But we, uh, we needed to add a MUX multiplexer. Okay, so how can we select an address to, and write to it? Let's take a look. Basically, we're gonna make this a little bit more complicated. Now we have write enable signals. Now this is our address. And if you want to write to that address, we also need to input the data to that address. Basically, the question is, whether the write enable signal gets propagated or not. So write enable, if write enable is one, and if we're writing to address zero, this should become a one, right? And that is the case over here, right? 
That is, if you enable zero, then you're not gonna write to it, no problem. So both of the, uh, these end gates will become zeros, so you're not gonna enable anything. But if write enable is one, and if address is zero, then this becomes a one, and this becomes a zero clearly, because address is zero. Right. Okay, so that's the idea over here. You need some write enable circuitry, and this write enable circuitry already is connected to the write enable bits over here, as you can see. Remember the gated D-latch, this is the write enable Bit. Basically, you need, to, you need to gate the write enable signal with the address decoder. So the word line, if the address is uh, correct and if you're writing to it, this, should, this write enable signal will become a one, and none of the other write enable signals, meaning over here, should be a one. Of course, this is the same. I'm not gonna repeat it over here. So let's put it all together. So basically, let's enable uh, reading and writing to a memory array. This is our memory array with the right enable signal, with the decoders, uh, with the decoder, and with the uh, multiplexers. And that's our memory array, that's it. We built a two address a memory array where each address can store three bits. And you can write to it, you can read from it. Now you can make it bigger. Now, I'm not gonna go through this, but this is the bigger version. So what I've done, what I've done is, addressability is three still, each location stores three bits, but now I have four locations. Right? And write enable is clearly, you need to handle that somehow, but this is our decoder again. Remember the decoder? This is a two to four decoder. And remember the multiplexer? This is a four to two multiplexer. No, four to one multiplexer, sorry. You basically select uh, from uh, four values over here. Again, it's the same principle, nothing different from here, except you widen the structures. If you want to design a bigger memory array, 2048 entries, you know how long your address needs to be, it's 11 bits, right? And you know how big your multiplexer needs to be, it's 2048 to one. And that's the difficulty of designing bigger memory arrays. As these numbers become bigger, these structures become bigger, and this becomes a huge mux. Imagine a 2048 to one mux. Okay, we didn't talk about timing, but this will take some, some time. Okay, so this is a great place to stop, I think. So let's come back two minutes after the bell. I'll keep the 10 minute invariant. Okay, I have had several questions during the break. I think some of you may be interested in knowing the answers. Let's start with the extra credit assignment. So this 1% per assignment is an absolute value. <laughs> Meaning this, if you if you, uh, let's, uh, the, the whole course grade is out of 100%, right? Assume that you did great, everything is good, you get 100% on all the assignments, all the exams, you'll get 100%. If you've done the additional assignment, you'll get 101%. Make sense? If you've done both of the additional assignments, you'll get 102%. Make sense? Assume that you didn't do too well, you got 50% on the required assignments, no worry. If you've done the additional assignment, one of them, you'll, your grade will not be 50, it'll be 51. If you've done both of them, your grade will not be 50, it'll be 52. So this is a great case, right? Makes sense. So it's an absolute value over the entire course grade in the end. So it's actually really good. I would recommend doing it. I can, you cannot find a better deal, I think. I guess a better deal would be if you get 10% from the assignment, but that would be unreasonable, right? <laughs> Yeah, so what does it mean to do the assignment? Basically, we're not gonna be harsh on grading these. As long as you submit something reasonable, something that makes sense, something that's good, you'll get the grade. We're not gonna be extremely uh, rigorous in checking every single thing that you write over there. Oh, you made a spelling mistake over here. No, we're not gonna do that. But as long as you submit something reasonable that shows that you understand what you read and you actually try to analyze what was said in the talk, you'll get the grade. Make sense? It's gonna be e a lot easier than your programming assignments later on. That's not to, not to discourage you from programming assignments, it will be great. But clearly this is something easier, right? Making a circuit work is usually harder than analyzing a talk. Okay, so the other question is related to this because I think uh, some people had questions about uh, how do you actually capture the value over here? What happens, right? So basically assume that you've written a one or zero over here using this, these mechanisms. I mean, even gated D-latch is the same. Uh, 
But basically, if S and R are both one over here, what happens is you have a feedback loop. The circuit continues evaluating forever, as long as power is connected to it. What does forever mean? Basically, what it does forever is this. You have some value Q over here. Now that Q gets propagated over here. This is one, so the output is definitely Q bar, because this is irrelevant, because it's an AND gate or NAND gate. So this evaluates to Q bar. Now that evaluates to, I guess, assuming that this is 0 or 1, this is 0. That becomes 1. That becomes 0. That becomes 0. That becomes 1. That keeps on going forever. Basically, this circuit keeps evaluating forever what's inside it. That's what a feedback loop is, actually. Makes sense, right? That's how you capture the value. And at any, at any time, as long as RNSR1, you read it, you get a stable value. You basically look at this output. It's either 1 or 0. In this case, I show a, I show a 1 over here, clearly. Right? OK, so keep that in mind. As long as it's powered up. Now, if the power goes away, all of this goes away anyway, because it's all volatile. OK, so you know how to build memories now. Now, this is our final memory structure. Because we know exactly how to build uh, the gated D-latch. We know its write enable value. We know how to build the decoder. We know how to build the multiplexer. We know how to build these additional gates. And underneath, we know how they operate, right? Now, we know how, how, how each of these uh, is actually built using different transistors. And we know the transistor is connected to power. And transistor operates by uh, transmitting voltages uh, from high, high voltage to low voltage, right? So as long as that everything is in place, this works. That's the beauty of going bottom up. Now you actually come to a structure that is memory that's bottom up. OK, any questions? Cool. So now, now that we know how to build uh, latches and memories, let's talk about sequential logic circuits. Now, it turns out the latch that we built will not be enough for our purposes in a little bit. But I will, I will show you that case. OK, but basically, we've looked at designs of circuit elements that can store information. Now we will use these elements uh, to build circuits that can remember past inputs. So I, I think of combinational lock uh, as something like this. This is clearly a combinational lock, right? You basically have a combination, and the output depends only on the current inputs that you have. But we also have a sequential circuit. This is a sequential lock. How many people use this one? OK, good. Some of, some of, you, are, some of you are familiar with it. How many people use this one? So this is more popular here, I guess. But this is more secure, maybe, potentially, because uh, it's a it has sequential. Uh, basically, this, this lock opens depending on past inputs. Here, for example, you put 1, 2, 3, 4. It doesn't open. OK, but it doesn't remember that you put 1, 2, 3, 4 also. You can try again. You put 9, 9, 9, 9. It doesn't open. But it doesn't remember that you put 1, 2, 3, 4 before or 9, 9, 9, 9 before. So every time you put some input, it evaluates. But here, that's not the case. Here, there is a complicated notion of state. It remembers what you've done previously. So basically, in order for this lock to work, it has to keep track of past events. So it has to remember past events. So for example, this lock may have a passcode of you turn it right to 13. So basically, this is the red part. You turn the thing right such that you stop at 13. And then you start turning left, such that you stop at 22. And then you start turning right, such that you stop at 3. Only if you do that sequence of events, this lock will open, because that's the code for this lock. Makes sense, right? Now, clearly, this is a sequential uh, logic, right? Basically, there are multiple states. The first state is state A. The lock is not open, and no relevant operations have been performed by the user. So that's a state. The second state, you're still locked, but the user has completed R13. Next state, it's still locked, but the user has completed R13, followed by L22. The next state, it's unlocked. User has completed R13, L22, and R3. Now it's unlocked. Now somebody locks it. Uh, you go back to state A. right? So if anything else happens in state A, if you actually turn it to I don't know, R15, for example, you'll stay at state A. Makes sense, right? Of course, you can build a more complicated lock that makes it even harder 
for people to open the lock if they've done something wrong, right? So by adding more states. But this lock itself has four states. So this is the notion of state, basically. This thing doesn't really have state in terms of opening the lock. Eventually, you get the combination lock right, and combination logic evaluates to one, and the lock opens. Right. OK. So basically, the state of a system is a snapshot of all relevant elements of the system at the moment of the snapshot. This is really important, because we need to represent this notion of state when we're actually building machines. So for example, to open the lock, states A to D must be completed in order. Right. You have to go from A to D. If you actually, for example, uh, are in state B, but the user does left 25 as opposed to 22, too bad. Probably you go to state A. So if anything else happens, for example, left 5 at any moment, lock returns to state A. Okay? And this is really a definition of the state machine. Basically, somebody who built this lock defined that this is my state machine. And only under these transitions, the user should be open, able to open the lock. And this is the state machine, basically. This is a state diagram, it's also called diagram, of our sequential lock. It completely describes the operation of the sequential lock. As I said, there are four states. Only in one state the output is opened, meaning the lock is opened. Uh, and you can, you can represent, basically, this state, uh, if you get input R13, you go to state B, you stay locked. If you get anything other than R13, you stay in the state. And in this state, if you get L22, you go to uh, state C, you stay locked. But if you get anything other than L22, you go back to state A. Similarly, in this state, if you get R3, you go to state D, which opens the lock. And if you get anything other than R3 over here, you go back to state A and start over. And in this state, now, of course, somebody needs to close the lock. It's not represented here. But uh, after you close the lock, if you get some... Uh, uh, let me see over here. If you get R13, actually, if you happen to get R13, after you close the lock over here, you go back to state B. That's one way of thinking about it. Make sense? But basically, computers are no different. They're state machines. We're actually going to see the state machine of a full computer later on in lecture 15 or so. But this is a very simple state machine. It is implemented using some mechanical stuff inside your lock. You can implement it using the logic circuit also. You can completely implement this using a logic circuit. You basically need to encode the states and store the states. You need to encode the output, whether the lock is open or not, one or zero. And you have four states. You can have two bits to represent each state, and we will see that. And you need to have combinational logic to ensure that you can go from one state to another state. And also combinational logic to decide the output. Okay. So you can actually implement that lock completely using everything that we've discussed, Boolean logic plus circuits. So we will understand state diagrams fully later today. But let me give you another simple example of state. The standard Swiss traffic light has four states. I hope that didn't change recently, right? Okay, I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. Okay, so green clearly is one state, yellow is another state, red is another state, and red and yellow is another state. Not every place in the world has four states, by the way. Some place is omit the last state over here. Yeah? <laughs> Don't be surprised. <laughs> Actually, when I was teaching this course at Texas, when I was a teaching assistant, I made the mistake of showing this diagram and people are gasping. Because this thing doesn't exist over there. So there was a disconnect. Am I really missing something important? Or <laughs> basically, it's, it's a different convention, right? The world is different, so state machines are also different. OK. But it was fun in the end that they realized that there's a purpose of this one, purpose for this one, too. <laughs> OK, anyway. But basically, the sequence of these states are always as follows. You go from A to B, B to C, C to D, and D to A, right? It's kind of a dumb state machine, assuming it's, a, it's not a smart traffic light. Assuming you stay equal time in each state, you can actually design this very, very simply. Okay, so basically, how do you change the state? That's what I'm going to get at. How do you go from here to here? Assume that there's no other input here, right? In the previous case, in the lock case, we had an input. The user was giving an input, and we changed the state based on the input. 
Here, there is no input. Here, you want to stay at the same state equal time. Let's assume that. How do you actually do that? Basically, when should the light change from one state to another? And this is the notion of clock. Basically, we need a clock uh, to dictate when to change the state. Clock is actually a nice synchronizer. It enables you to change the state at a clock boundary. But basically, it's a signal that's it's like a maestro. When, it's, when it hits the boundary, let's say one boundary is a positive edge of the clock, let's say, then you can change the state. During when the clock is not hitting the positive edge, basically when the clock is not going from 0 to 1, you cannot change the state. That's one definition, of course. There are multiple ways of designing this, but I'm going to use this one. So basically, the, let's assume that we have a clock signal that alternates between 0 and 1, like this. And there's some time associated with it. It stays uh, as 1 for some time, and it stays as 0 some other, some equal amount of time, let's say. Even that can be changed. Uh, but assume that it keeps alternating. For time t, it stays at 1. For uh, another time t, it stays at 0. Another time t, let's, let's give a t some number, 5 seconds. For five seconds, it stays at one. Next five seconds, it stays at zero. Next five seconds, it stays at one. Next five seconds, it stays at zero, dot, dot, dot. Nice. Now you can use this to synchronize state changes. At the start of the clock cycle, which is this part, system state changes. During a clock cycle, the state stays constant. That's what we're going to assume. And this is going to be the basis of our sequential machines, sequential designs. You can only change the state at the beginning of the clock cycle, during the clock cycle, you evaluate that state. If the state, basically there's some combinational logic that can evaluate during that time. In this case, the traffic light, assume that what I said is true, five seconds here, five seconds here, you'll stay in state A, 10 seconds. And then the clock hits, you change to state B, and you'll stay at state B for 10 more seconds. And then the clock hits again, goes from 0 to 1, which is the start of the clock cycle, this part. You'll stay in state C for 10 seconds. And then the clock hits after 10 seconds. And then you stay in state D for 10 seconds. And then you go back to state A and repeat, basically. So basically, we're assuming the traffic light stays in this each state an equal amount of time. Makes sense, right? So now we're going to make this work in a real circuit. How do you actually make this work? How do you make a state element change its state only at the beginning of the clock cycle? OK, so let's talk about the notion of clock, because it's really important in the end. We talked about the notion of state. State is hopefully easier to understand. Clock is a general mechanism that triggers transition from one state to another in a sequential circuit. Basically, it synchronizes state changes across many sequential circuit elements. You may be doing 100 different things at the same time. When the clock hits, they basically change their state meaning that the combinational logic that, they evaluate, that evaluates their next state gets lashed into the registers, as we will see. So basically, combinational logic evaluates for the length of the clock cycle. Let's assume your clock cycle is 20 seconds. You have some combinational circuit. Inputs are ready at the beginning of the clock cycle because state changed. And you basically evaluate. Hopefully, evaluation is done by the end of the clock cycle, that 10 seconds. And when the clock cycle hits again, all of the latches and registers capture the value coming out of the combinational circuit. Makes sense, right? Basically, combinational logic evaluates for the length of that clock cycle. And clock cycle should be chosen to accommodate the maximum combinational circuit delay. So we're, we're going to see this more when we talk about timing. But you may have the question, OK, in the traffic light, you choose the clock cycle based on how long you want to stay in each state. But Computers are not traffic lights, right? You need to do something. You have some combinational logic. How do you choose your clock cycle? Basically, you can say, I want to operate uh, my machine at 10 gigahertz. And in that case, your clock cycle is one picosecond, right? If I didn't do the, is it picoseconds? Nanoseconds, sorry. 10 gigahertz is nanoseconds. It's 10 to the minus 9. If you want to do 1,000 gigahertz, 1 terahertz, then it's picoseconds. OK. OK. Basically, you say that I'm going to operate at, um, no, I made a mistake again. So one, uh, one gigahertz is one nanoseconds. 10 gigahertz is one tenth of a nanosecond, 0 0.1 nanoseconds. OK. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You choose your clock cycle, and that dictates the time during which your combination logic should evaluate. So assume that you've designed a combination logic that takes much longer to evaluate. 
finish. What do you do? Either you need to cut your combination logic such that it fits in the clock cycle, or you extend the clock cycle. That's going to be very important. As a designer, you have the choice in your design cycle, uh, clock cycle. But this is going to be important when we talk about timing. So more on this later when we discuss the timing. For now, know that at the edge of the clock, when the clock goes from 0 to 1, the state elements capture their data. So with this in mind, we're going to build finite state machines. We've seen finite state machines earlier with the state diagram, for example, or the Swiss traffic light example. They're very simple finite state machines. Now we're going to look at how they're really built. So what is a finite state machine? It's really a discrete time model of a stateful system. You have a stateful system which goes from state to state based on some inputs. You're basically modeling it as a discrete time model. Each state represents a snapshot of the system at a given time. And you can actually pictorially represent it. And I've already given you the example, pictorial examples, right? Remember the sequential lock pictorial example? Actually, let me go back. Well, this is a finite state machine, actually, for the Swiss traffic light. This is a finite state machine for the, uh, the sequential lock. That's a pictorial representation of a finite state machine. And we're going to do many pictorial representations like this. Basically, this finite state machine pictorially should show two things. The set of all possible states that a system can be in, and how the system transitions from one state to another. And it should basically completely specify the system that way. So an FSM can model a traffic light, an elevator, fan speed, a microprocessor, anything. You can actually use the FSM to model the world, but it may be a different, not, a, not such an easy FSM. Because in the end, we're also living in a finite state machine. You can think about it that way. But we're not going to model it. We're going to, do, we're going to stop at the microprocessor here. OK, so an FSM enables us to pictorially think of a stateful system using simple diagrams. OK, so they, what do they consist of? They consist of five elements, and these are all important. First of all, a finite number of states. Maybe world, world uh, actually violates that. I'm not sure. Maybe we cannot imagine enough. That's why world, is, uh, world looks infinite. But for microprocessors, we're going to deal with finite number of states. So state, again, to jog your memory that I just described earlier, snapshot of all relevant elements of the system at the time of the snapshot. Keep this in mind. So uh, a finite number of external inputs. So inputs need to be finite again. A finite number of external outputs. Clearly, your circuit needs to input, uh, have, have inputs and outputs to be useful. An explicit specification of all state transitions. How should you transition from state x to state y? On, under what conditions? How to get from one state to another? An explicit specification of what determines each external output value. This is really important also, because external outputs will be observable to someone, maybe to the next circuit that you have, or maybe to the user, right? OK. So all finite state machines consist of three things. Basically, next state logic. How do you determine the next state at the end of the clock cycle? What happens? Uh, or at the beginning of the next clock cycle, what, how do you transition to next state? State register, this basically indicates what state you're in. And output logic. How do you determine your output uh, variables? OK, and we represent a finite state machine like this. Your microprocessor would look very similar to this, for example. So basically, this is our next state logic. This is our state register. Basically, that encodes our state. If we can have, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, 64 states, you need six bits in your state register. If you need to have a million states, you need a lot more bits in your register, clearly. But this is the encoding of your state. And Output logic. Basically, what does next state logic do? Well, that's the state register. Uh, it, it basically has the current state and some inputs, and based on that, it decides what the next state should be. And at the beginning of the clock cycle, next state value, the encoding, is latched into the state register, as well as potential outputs that need to go to the next state. Right? And this is the state, and this is the output logic. Output logic, enable, output logic basically enables you to determine what the outputs should be. This, should, this could be also dependent on the inputs. That's not shown over here, but that's OK. OK. So to, uh, hopefully this is clear. We're going to look at how to design these machines. Uh, so sequential circuits consist of state registers. Uh, they store the current state and load the next state at the clock edge. So basically, we need an element that looks like this. So, it's going to be very similar to your latch, but we'll see that your latch doesn't satisfy the requirement that we want from this. 
So basically, you have some input to this register, S bar, which is next state, and you have some current state. You use the current state to evaluate the combinational logic and decide the next state. But at the, when the clock hits, at the edge of the clock, your current state should take the value of the next state. Right? That's how you latch the data inside this register. That's, you, need to, you need to load the next state at the clock edge. And we will see that whatever we discussed previously doesn't satisfy this requirement because the latch itself does not have this edge-triggered behavior, meaning that whenever the clock changes from 0 to 1, uh, the latch itself actually captures the data, but it also captures the data while the clock is 1, or while the right enable is 1. So as long as the right enable is 1, the latch itself is capturing data. This is not good, as we will see. OK, so we also want combinational circuits. Basically, next state logic is combinational. It has some inputs, and it determines the next state, which gets fed into here. And output logic, as we will also see. So it generates the outputs, basically. OK, so sequential circuits are here. And combinational circuits, we've already known them, but we're going to look at them again later on. So let's take a look at the sequential circuit. So how do we implement the state register? So basically, how do we implement the state register? We want two properties out of this, based on what we've discussed, right? Because uh, basically, we need to store the data in this register at the beginning of every clock cycle. We have this clock that we discussed. At the beginning of the clock cycle, when the clock transitions from 0 to 1, the input to this register should go into the output of the register. And it should stay at that output during the entire clock cycle, which is the next one. Basically, the data that you latched at the beginning of the clock cycle should be available during the entire clock cycle over here, so that you can evaluate the combinational logic that needs that data that's inside the state register, because the combinational logic needs to know which state you're in to take the appropriate actions. Right. Make sense? So these properties are really critical for you to construct a state machine, uh, a sequential circuit. Now let's take a look at the desired behavior. This is our clock. This is the input to the register, meaning what's coming into the state register. If you have something like this, this should not affect your output, meaning the, this should not affect the value that you store inside the register. Why? Because this didn't happen at the edge of the clock. Remember, clock is a synchronizer. You should change state only at the beginning of the clock, because that's how you can make sense of, out of everything. So the output of the register should be this way. Make sense? So for example, here, input is 0. So far, it was 0. Here, the input is 1. At the beginning of the clock cycle, it's 1. So the register output, meaning the register captures that 1. That's good. Here, the input is still 1. Stays at 1 at the beginning of the next clock cycle. The input changes, you don't care about it because it happens during the clock cycle, not at the beginning of the clock cycle. Here it's still 1, so you capture 1. Here it's still 1, you capture 1. Here it's still, well, it becomes 0 over here, so you capture 0, right? Makes sense. So that's the desired behavior. The question is, how do we get this desired behavior such that we capture the data only when the clock changes and not uh, when uh, the clock doesn't change? Okay. Well, only when the clock changes from 0 to 1. That's what I mean. OK, so the problem with latches is this. We call the gate a D latch. We built this. It's nice. It's controllable. Now let's assume that write enable is equal to clock, which makes sense, right? Basically, we want to, we want to be able to write to the state register whenever the clock uh, is zero, goes from 0 to 1. Now if you do this, this doesn't work. Basically, you cannot simply wire a clock to the write enable signal of a latch. Because whenever the clock is I, uh, high, the latch propagates D to Q. Basically, if the clock is 1, Q captures the value of D. And if the value of D changes while the clock is 1, you will change the value of Q. But we just said that we don't want that. We want the value to change only when the clock goes from 0 to 1, not when the clock is 1. right? Because we are going to use that value in the state register to do other stuff during the entire clock cycle. Right? That's the idea. So this is the problem with latches. The latch is transparent, meaning it propagates the value of D to Q whenever this right enable is set to 1. It transparently moves D to Q. So let's take a look at it. The, exact, the same example that I showed you earlier, this is our input. It has this change that happens. And this becomes our output if you use a latch. This is not the desired behavior, clearly, because the value changes 
while the clock is not going from zero to one. Right? In fact, the value can change multiple times. Anytime the register input changes while the clock is one, you will get a change over here immediately reflected. We don't want that. We want the change to only happen at the beginning of the clock cycle because that's the maestro. That's when we want to change the state of the system. Okay, so we don't want these basically. So okay, how can we, ch the question is how do we build what we desire? How can we change the latch so that the D input is observable at Q only at the beginning of the next clock cycle or at the beginning of a clock cycle, let's say, uh, or next clock cycle because D may have changed, but if, it, if the change didn't happen at the beginning of the clock cycle, the change should be reflected at the end of the clock cycle, right, next clock cycle. And Q, the output should be available for the full clock cycle. So these are the two properties we want. So we need a new storage element for this, basically, to design viable finite state machines. And we need storage elements that allow us to read the current state throughout the current clock cycle. I've been repeating the same thing and again and again, and not write the next state values into the storage elements until the beginning of the next clock cycle. So you know this very well by now. So now I'm going to introduce a D flip-flop. It has an interesting name, it's flip-flop. Uh, basically, it changes state only on the clock edge, and data is available for the full clock cycle. Now the downside is going to come at a lot more hardware cost. So we're going to start with the D-latch, this is our master, and we're going to add another D-latch. That's our slave. And hopefully you can convince yourself that this is going to satisfy those two properties. Why? Because this master is going to control what gets propagated into Q. So now D cannot immediately go into Q, right? It cannot because it has to first go through here, and of course it depends on what you do over here. I'm going to do something clever over here. I'm going to wire clock bar, inverted clock over here as the right enable signal. I'm going to wire the regular clock signal over here as the right enable signal. Which means that while this right enable signal is one, meaning while the clock is zero, this D gets propagated over here. As we know, it's a D latch. And when this clock signal is one, whatever is here gets propagated over here, right? Okay, so let's take a look at this. When the clock is low, meaning over here, the master latch propagates D to the input of the slave, which is over here, which means that this Q un gets unchanged. It's completely unchanged while the clock is low. That's good. Now only when the clock is high, the slave latches D, meaning the value that was propagated over here goes into Q. So when this becomes, that happens. Now, the key is that happens at the rising edge of the clock, when the clock goes from zero to one. Because if the clock is zero, this D gets here. When the clock becomes one, whatever it got here goes to here. Makes sense. Now, when the clock is one, we want to ensure that this doesn't affect Q. And that is clear that it doesn't affect Q because this doesn't change, right? When the clock is one, you're writing whatever values here to here, but you're not writing whatever values here to here because this is inverted. When the clock is one, you get a zero in the right enable, and this data value doesn't get propagated over here. So you have a stable signal over here. Make sense? So that's the idea over here. I mean, you need to go through this to really understand it, but the key idea is this master protects the slave, in a sense, such that the output of the slave doesn't change while the clock is high. The output of the slave changes only when clock transitions from zero to one, in this case. That's the idea. And the reason is because we wired things this way. The value of the mast master captures its input only when clock is low, and the slave captures its input, which is coming from the master, only when clock is high. And even though this latch is still transparent, there's no problem, meaning that, uh, transparent, meaning that the latch captures whatever value is here during the entire time when the clock is high. That is true, but the value that's here is not changing during that time because there's a protector over here that ensures that this value over here doesn't change during the, when the clock is high. Makes sense, right? That's the idea. 
Now we've constructed a mechanism that can capture the state only when clock goes from zero to one. Now if you did something differently, remove this inverter, put clock over here, and put an inverter over here, what would happen is it would be very similar, except this Q value would change only when clock goes from high to low, one to zero. It's still a flip-flop, but it's, it depends on when the state transition happens. Make sense? So this is called an edge-triggered flip-flop. Yeah. Okay, I already said this, I think. And this is, so th this huge thing, a big circuit, you can count the number of transistors here, it's a lot, right? Remember the NAND gates, each NAND gate has four transistors. Now we have 32 transistors at least over here, plus inverters, a bunch of inverters over here. So this is close to 40 plus transistors. But you can also abstract it with this module, this is our module, it's the D flip-flop. It has a D input, it has a Q output, and a Q bar output if you want it. At the rising edge of the clock, Q gets assigned D. At all other times, Q is unchanged. And now we have the state element that we want. And we can use these flip-flops to implement the state register now. Okay, so this is also called rising clock edge triggered flip-flop. It has two inputs, clock and D. Function is, it samples D on the rising edge of the clock, positive edge. I already told you how to do it at the falling edge of the clock, negative edge. Rising edge means clock is going from zero to one. Falling edge means clock is going from one to zero. When clock rises from zero to one, D passes through Q. Otherwise, Q holds its previous value. So it's perfect for our state element, state register. Q changes only on the rising edge of the clock. So a flip-flop is called an edge-triggered state element because it captures data on the uh, clock edge. Whereas a latch, as we've seen, it's a level-triggered state element. Basically, it captures data when the level of clock is one or when the level of right enable is one. Assuming that you wire clock to right enable, when the level of clock is one, you keep capturing the data. Right? But we like this edge-triggered behavior. So your book actually has a bunch of other flip-flops that you can read. Actually, I have them on the uh, backup slides. You will see and you will get exposed to them later on. I'm not going to cover them here uh, right now. It's, it's fun to think about them, but they all, they all are variants of what I just said. So now you can have a register using flip-flops. This way you can actually represent multiple bits. So you can have a register using latches. It'll be level-triggered. It will be transparent. You can have a register using flip-flops. Now that'll be edge-triggered a register. So essentially, this is a four-bit register that I showed you earlier, and this is a condensed form. And uh, somebody asked during the break, actually, what does this terminology mean? It basically means that you have a data input that has four bits. Most significant bit is three. Least significant bit is marked as zero. That's the idea. And your uh, Q output, that's four bits also. Uh, most significant bit is three, and least significant bit is zero. You will see this a lot when we talk about Verilog when you do your designs. And this, this also indicates that this is a four-bit input, four-bit output. And you can see that this is a clock. And that sort of signal actually, again, it's notation, but it says it's edge-triggered. That triangle over there means it's edge-triggered. OK, I think I've already said all of this. And you can actually uh, have a four-bit D flip-flop uh, internally this way. Right? You, can see, you can see that it's a lot of area. Right? We started from the cross-coupled inverter which was four transistors, we came to this, which was 40 plus transistors. And if you have four bits, it's 160 plus transistors. All right. Okay, so let's talk about finite state machines in the remaining time. So now next state is determined by the current, we know how to build a state register. Next state is determined by the current state and the inputs. And there are two types of finite state machines that differ in the output logic. We're gonna see both of them. So a more finite state machine has outputs depend only on the current state. So if you look over here, the output logic just take state as input and not inputs over here. The external inputs don't affect the output in this state. Merely FSM, it differs only in the fact that the outputs depend on, the, on not only just the current state, but also the external inputs. So you can see that external inputs also affect the outputs. These are two different ways of designing state machines, and we will see them in a little bit. Okay, let me give you an example of a finite state machine. We're going to start with that traffic light. We're going to make it a bit smarter. So it's not going to be smart enough for anyone who's driving. And this is actually an important area because it's not clear how you make traffic lights smarter, but we're going to assume that this is smart traffic light controller. 
So uh, we have two avenues. This is directly from your book. You can read this and you can understand it even more in more detail. We have two inputs, traffic sensors, TA and TB. Uh, these are true when there's traffic. Basically, TA is true when there's traffic in the academic avenue, and TB is true when there's traffic in the Bravada avenue. Whatever. It has two outputs also, two lights, light A and light B. And each light uh, can be red, yellow, or green in this case. We don't have the fourth state here. And state can change every five seconds. So there is a clock that basically changes the state every five seconds, except for the case that when, you, when the light is green and there's traffic on the line, that light should stay green. Sounds terrible, right? <laughs> you shouldn't be on the avenue that doesn't have green and traffic. Uh, that, that's on the other avenue, basically, in that case. But this is a smart traffic light that your book designs. You can design a better one. So this is basically the uh, fi uh, black box of the finite state machine. It has two inputs, traffic lights, state of the traffic light. Uh, oh, no, not the lights. This is basically traffic. Traffic sensors, state of the traffic sensors, state of the traffic lights as output. And there's a reset signal, which we're not going to talk about, but that basically determines your first state. That's really important, actually. You start from this state, and there's a clock. So inputs are these four. Outputs are these. So let's take a look at the transition diagram. Basically, we're going to have a Moore FSM where outputs are labeled in each state. Outputs depend only on the state. States are the circles. This is state zero. Light A is green, light B is red. Sounds good. Transitions are arcs, and this is where we are going to start from. Reset state. You have to state, uh, have a reset state in any finite state machine. OK, so if there's no traffic on A, uh, if there's traffic on A, A stays green forever. Sounds terrible, but. That's the specification. If there's no traffic on state, uh, on, on, on this avenue A, academic avenue, whatever it is, then at the clock edge, you transition to the next state. Right? Basically, you sample at the clock edge what happens to the traffic. And if there's no traffic, then you transition over here. If, the, if it happens after one clock cycle, you transition to state one after one clock cycle. If the traffic doesn't end, you stay in the state forever. That's the bug in the smart traffic light, clearly. But the next state is it's, uh, A is yellow and light B is red. Sounds good. Next state is light A is red and light B is green, and dot, dot, dot. And you can complete the state diagram, basically. It's not that difficult. So going from this state to this state is unconditional. You can see that it's because it's yellow, after some number of seconds, you go into the state. right? Because that, that matches the specification. But now you're in, you're, the light B is green. And if there's traffic on B, you can stay in the state. And then you transition to yellow if there's no traffic. And then you unconditionally transition over here. And then you keep repeating this loop. So that's our state machine. And you, now you can actually and, uh, represent this with a state transition table. So we have four states, clearly. S0, S1, S2, S3. We have two inputs, TA and TB. And now we can decide which, what is the next state depending on the current state and the inputs. This is our state transition table. It's very similar to a truth table, but we have an x input. x means it doesn't matter. It's don't care. So, OK, let's take a look. If our current state is S0, and if there's no traffic on TA, it doesn't matter what TB is. Next state is S1. If our current state is S0, if there's traffic uh, on, uh, on the traffic sensor A, it doesn't matter what TB is, the next state is S0. We stay in the same state. So I keep doing this. Basically, you can form this table relatively easily. For example, this one. If your state is S3, it doesn't matter what your inputs are. At the clock edge, you're going to go into next state S0. Right? Now you can build this using combinational logic. Right? Now, now, assume that your state encoding is this way. We're going to talk about state encoding later. But clearly, we have four states. We need four, two bits to encode the state. And our, next regist our state register is two bits in this case. Now you can actually expand this. Sounds good, right? Now we have a truth table. These are our inputs of the current state. These are our external inputs, and these are our outputs, next state. Outputs meaning the, what should the next state register be? Now we can design a combinational logic that implements S1 prime, and I'll let you do that. Basically, it's essentially what we've done in the last lecture, but it's a lot easier right now because a lot of them don't, don't care. But this, is, this turns out to be the combination logic for S1 prime. And S0 prime, it turns out to be this one. 
So you can basically calculate the bits of the next state using the state transition table that you filled out based on the specification of the finite state machine that you created based on the specification of how the light should behave. Okay, so if you simplify it, of course now you go and simplify it in logic, this turns out to be XOR, and that turns out to be not simplifiable further. So output table is this, this is basically, we also have outputs which are the lights, right? And these depend solely on the state. If you're in state zero, which is zero, zero, light A should be green and light B should be red, and you basically have similar outputs over here. Now you need to have an output encoding. So encode light A, uh, green as zero, zero, yellow as zero, one, red as one, zero. And you basically construct a truth table. Now you can specify what light A first bit should be, light A second bit should be dot, dot, dot. And that's our output basically. Based on the state bits, I can detain, determine our outputs. So there's no magic here. These are all combinational logic as you can see. Okay, and this is the schematic that we have in our finite state machine, but I'm going to sk skip this. We're going to start with this one next week. Okay, have a good weekend.